Hello, YouTube Sidekick here with the next installment of the fine art of rocket science. This is part two of the series. If you haven't watched part one, you may want to go do that, as this will probably make a lot more sense if you do. In part one, uh, we spent a bit of time going over the history of the aerial rocket and talked a little bit about the principles of how they're used. Uh, we ended that session by going out in the HN and doing some range runs. So I think we should start um, this episode by finishing off the analysis of the work that we did in the first episode on the A-10. And then after that, we can take a look at what we want to do next. And, and I think that probably what we're going to want to look at next is the A-4. So we're going to spend some time on the range in the A-4, building a site depression table. And then maybe we're actually going to go out and uh, practice. So let's get started. The idea of the range ones runs was to build a site depression table for the A-10 by looking at where the CCIP computer projected that the rockets would land um, based on the range to the target. Now, we don't really need a site depression table for the A-10 since, well, we have a CCIP computer. But by doing this, we can confirm what the table looks like. Specifically, we expect to see that the table has basically a couple of different regions to it. At long ranges, we expect the table to show a site depression that changes with range, and which will likely depend on our dive angle and speed as well. And we'll call this the standoff zone. Inside some range, we expect to see that the site angle begins to stabilize and is independent of other aircraft parameters, and let's call this the uh, normal attack zone. So let's take a look at how to make the calculation based on the recording of the A-10 flight that we made last time. As I said in the last episode, um, this kind of takes me back to earlier in my career when I did a lot of something called photogrammetry, which is really just nothing more than extracting measurements from photos and videos. To make a measurement on this video, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put the HUD on the screen, and notice that the HUD has a convenient scale that is graded in five degree increments. And then I'm going to draw a little rectangle here on the screen that measures five degrees high. Now, I can... Uh, I'm going to assume that the distance doesn't change as we go through this run, so I'm assuming the field of view isn't changing. But I can see how big the rectangle is in pixels, and then I know that that number of pixels in the video corresponds to 5 degrees on HUD. Since 5 degrees is a little coarse as a scale, I'm going to subdivide it a little bit more, and I'm just going to make a little scale here that's graduated in 1 degree increments. Now, I can put this on the screen and move the video forward, and at any time, I can measure the difference between the flight path vector, this little blivet with the three lines coming out of it, and the CCI pipper here in the center of the screen. And then from these measurements, I can build a site depression table. Now, one more thing I should mention is the issue of units. Now, there are already measurements in several units on the screen already. Uh, we have the range in nautical miles, we have the speed in knots, we have an altitude in feet, we have an angle in degrees. Well, I'm going to add a couple more. I'm actually going to convert the range in nautical miles to meters, which may seem a little bit weird, but for me, with my background in the artillery, that's pretty much how I think about range, so that's the number I'm going to use. The other unit that I'm going to introduce is the milliradian, or mil. Now, to a mathematician, the milliradian is one one-thousandth of a radian, where a radian is the angle that is subtended by an arc that is equal to the radius of the circle that it is part of. The important thing to know about a milliradian is that if you look at something that's a thousand meters away and you move your aim left or right by one mil, you will have moved left or right by one meter on the ground. So if you move by 50 mils, you'll have moved by 50 meters. So the one small wrinkle is that according to the mathematical definition of a milliradian, there are 6,284 mils in a circle. The military, on the other hand, defines a mil as one sixty-four hundredth of a circle, and which is just so they can use a more round number and still retain the basic, basic effect that at 1,000 on 1, meters, one mil equals a meter. So, since there are 360 degrees in a circle, it means that there are 17.44 uh, mathematical milliradians in a degree and 17.77 military mils in a degree, but the military has decided to keep the numbers around by just saying that there are actually 17 and a half mils in a degree. So that's what we're going to use. So with all of that in hand, here are the results that we get from the A10C video. So again, I'm not really interested in the numbers themselves. As I said, the CCIP computer handles that for us. But look at the curve. It does exactly what we expected it to do. In this region, the site depression depends on range. 
linearly, which is in itself interesting, but not something we're going to pursue here. And in this region, it's flat. So the point being that for a normal attack run where the rocket is flying straight at the target, we really want to be in this region of the graph. This will be particularly important when we fly aircraft that don't have a CCIP pipper, because in those, those aircraft, we will want to pick a particular site depression. And if we pick a site depression in this region, it will mean that our accuracy won't depend on getting the other flight parameters exactly right when we press the button. Okay, so that's the principle involved. What should we do next here? Well, I think we should go out and build a site depression table for a more challenging case, one where we don't have a CCIP pipper. Uh, so let's take a look at the choices we have. I mean, this isn't a comprehensive list by any means, but it basically is the list of that I can do, because these are the rocket-carrying aircraft in DCS that I own. Um, now, these ones come with a CCI pipper, so they're not all that interesting. Uh, I do own the F-86, but I haven't flown it a lot, um, and I want to get it into this series. It's part of the reason why I wanted to do it, but I'm not really ready to try it just yet. So I think the obvious choice to start with is, of course, the A-4. So let's go to the range. All right, here we are at Kobaletti, and uh, we're going out to our usual iron bombing test range. we got a load on our A4. We've got both the uh, 2.75 FFARs and the 5-inch uh, Zunis for this run. Let's uh, get airborne here. Okay, uh, first order business is to get ourselves uh, fenced in here. I think maybe we'll do the 2.75 inch uh, rockets first. So we'll do the outside pods. Just get ourselves worked out here. Okay, so once again, I'm gonna go out to the range uh, and uh, once I'm fenced in here and I'm gonna do a trim run and I won't bother showing you guys all of that uh, getting set up. Uh, procedure today is gonna be a little different than it was the last time, uh, but I'll tell you about that on the other side. Catch you in a sec after I've got myself set up on the range. Okay, here we are coming around after the trim run for our first run with the 2.75 inch rockets. So unlike last time with the A-10 where we had a uh, sight and a pipper, uh, and we could just do a run and uh, we didn't even have to fire anything. We just calculated what the site depression is. This time we're kind of have to kind of do um, recce by fire. Uh, so what we're going to do, uh, I'm going to roll in and I'm going to put the site on the target. So I'm going to put the site on the target. That's going to be the constant aiming point. And I'm going to fire uh, rockets at various ranges. And then in the video, we're going to go back and figure out where they actually land so we can figure out what the site depression would have had to be in order for those rockets to um, hit the target, if you follow what I mean. And from that, we're gonna build a site uh, depression table. And hopefully we're also gonna find the same thing as we did with the A-10, which is that there's a region where basically the site depression stops changing. Now, unlike the A-10, where the rocket pods are aimed downwards a little bit, so we had a minimum 35 mil site deflection, I think in the A-10, or we're going to find that the minimum is actually zero, but we'll see. So here we go. Get lined up. First two. Second two. First two landing. Third. And fourth. And one more. Okay, so you can see that the last two actually basically landed on the target. Uh, so the aim point didn't change. So you can actually see as the rockets kind of walked up to the target um, that the aim point was definitely uh, changing. Um, okay, so, well, that's good enough for that for now. Let's, let's um, so let's go out and just do a quick practice run just to confirm what I think I saw in that run, which is that you get close enough with the FFARs and you have to be pretty close um, I'll be able to tell you exactly when I do the calculations, but once you get close enough 
with the FFIRs, you can basically just aim at the center of the target. So um, I'm going to go around here again. Just going to do sort of a confirmation run. We'll put the pipper on the target and we'll fly in good and close. And then we'll uh, launch the whole uh, shooting match. I've, I've got myself on uh, unlimited ammo, so the pods will refill themselves here. So one thing that, that I noticed, certainly, uh, that I'll take a look at when I look at the video, but I think we're going to find when we uh, review that. The other thing is you notice the dispersion of the rockets is much larger. At long range, uh, those rockets, the two that we fired, were really far apart. I think that's another aspect, especially the FFARs, even more than the, the Hydra 70s, the later versions. They're just not very accurate at anything but really short range. But at short range, um, they do seem to, they were all in the target area. So um, I think maybe a part of my struggles with uh, 2.75 inch rockets is I've just been trying to use them at far too long a range, especially um, the A4, because it's using the FFARs, the Mark 40s uh, are a lot less accurate than the Hydra 70s. And I, I just hadn't really accounted for that until I started So I used to be pretty unhappy with my results with uh, the 2.75 inch rockets, but maybe this is going to help. Okay, so we're going to roll in. We're rolling in, we're just pulling the top of the sight ring up to the target because that's where we turn around. And then we're going to pull the pipper up to the target slowly. Hold it there until we're good and close. Good and close. Really, really good and close. Then, yeah, we basically covered the target area. So that wasn't a bad run at all, but we had to get pretty close. I mean, you'd be well within any AAA range uh, by the time you're doing that, but um, put a whole lot of hurt on that target area. Okay, switching to the Zunis now. And we're going to go out and we're going to do exactly the same thing as we just did with the FFARs. I'm just going to do one run where we line up at distance and we're just going to fire uh, rockets all the way in. And I'm going to go back in the video later and I'm going to look at where they landed. And then I'm going to back up uh, the video to where they were fired from and look at where that would have been on the site. And that's going to give me a deflection. In other words, I'm going to assume that if I had deflected the target that the site by that many mills up or down then the rocket would have landed that much higher so let's see if i can say that better um, when i see where the rocket lands i'm going to rewind the tape to look at where that would have been on the site when the rocket was fired and i'm going to assume that if i had deflected the site by that many mills then i would have been able to get the rocket on the target so that's how we're going to uh, calculate a site depression table for the rockets for the A4. All right, getting ready to come around here one more time. So again, I'm just going well out, uh, well beyond where I would probably normally use the rockets because I just want to get a, a good long range look. So, you know, essentially what we're finding with the rockets here is that you can use them kind of in standoff, almost like sniping mode. Um, but you're going to have to be a lot more careful about controlling your dive angle and your speed um, and launching them at exactly the right time. But it probably is possible to launch them from longer distances. But if you want to do a straight up attack uh, in the A4, certainly with the FFARs, you just dial up zero on your sight and fly till you're close enough um, and then you just let go. All right, getting ready to roll in. Once again, we're just going to put the pipper on the target for the whole run. We're just going to fire a series of rockets, and then we're going to watch where they land compared to the target, because we're going to know that all of them were actually aimed at the target. So let me just clean myself up here, get the pipper up to the target, and here we go. And the first two. Second two. 
compared to yeah, watch them walking right up to the target. Okay, those were on target. The last ones are on target. Okay, so well, one thing you can see there was a whole lot less dispersion. I mean, the rockets just in general are a whole lot more accurate, even at longer range than the FFARs were. But the other thing you can notice is the same as the FFARs. They kind of walked up to the target, and then at some range, um, they're just uh, essentially going where you aim them. Uh, the trick is just to be inside that range. So let's go do like we did with the FFARs. Let's just do a little confirmation of that. We'll go into a single run, uh, launch all of the rockets, basically at the center of the target. And if we're close enough, uh, we shouldn't even need a sight deflection by what I'm seeing. Let's go give that little uh, hypothesis a try here. Okay, so definitely seeing that the Zunis are uh, not only a longer ranged option, but um, definitely a more accurate choice than the FFAR. So uh, when we're talking uh, mid-1960s rockets, the, uh, the FFARs, uh, and they kind of had that reputation. Um, they were good at pretty short range. They, they were uh, helicopter pilots liked them. Um, but uh, I think they're pretty uh, hard to use from the jets. Um, and I think that part of the reason why the Hydra 70s developed um, a new uh, fin and a new uh, spin stabilization method was that just found that the FFARs were just a little bit too flaky. Especially if you fired them in salvos, they tended to uh, interfere with one another and just end up going all over the map. Which is certainly what it looked like um, there in that last run. But the Zunis are a lot tighter. So let's see if we can uh, take out that target with a nice uh, tight concentration of Zunis. I think again trick is we just got to wait long enough. All right, here we go, pulling up. Once again, I like to have that top of that ring visible on my sight. I know that's the point where we roll around. I get it rolled up just under the target. And I can pull the pipper up. Put the pipper on the target. Oh, I'm going to hold. Good and close. There we go. And right down the throat. Okay, I think that confirms what we've uh, been finding. And I also think that's probably enough for today. Um, in the next uh, video, I will do the video analysis to actually construct the site tables. And then maybe we'll look and actually do some practicing with some real targets and compare the ranges we can use these things at uh, to like the threat distances and that sort of thing. So. I hope you'll continue to watch the series. Um, let me know what you think in the comments. For now, this is Sidekick, signing off.